Charles Antony's and Artaphernes sigh as they both look on the horizon and see their belly's faction that is the Ionians. The revolt that shook the Persian Empire to its core is about to begin. Hello guys, the History Builder here, and today we are going to examine three major events. First, the Siege of Con- well, not Constantinople, Byzantium. So, first, first things first, whenever you say Byzantium, you're, you cannot refer to Byz the Byzantine Empire or Constantinople. That just doesn't make sense. Historically, it's okay, but if you actually look at the history... Not really. I know that sentence didn't make sense at all, but so let's go to the next one. The next one will be the Battle of Ephesus, and the third will be the Ionian Revolt. So um, I'm gonna show you a map of the expansion of the Achaemenid Empire or the First Persian Empire. I like to call it the latter, not the former. So. Um, the siege of Byzantium was in 510 BC, and there were four unsuccessful but three successful sieges in the BC era. Because, you know, there were. And this first one, first earliest recorded one, is one of them. So, Cyrus the Great and Darius the Great both expanded the empire greatly. And during Darius's reign, we shall look at the siege of Byzantium, then the following events, that'll come through. So, let us get to it, and I will show you what will happen. A quick note, Byzantium is modern-day Istanbul, which used to be called Constantinople during the Middle Ages, but became Istanbul after the Ottomans besieged it and destroyed Constantinople. This map I made myself. It is doubtful that there actually was a battle of Byzantium, but there was definitely a siege. Since I do not have any records for actually any battle, I'm just assuming this battle actually happened, and as it's actually soldiers defending it, as was a Greek city-state. The defenders supposedly, I assume so, defended from their Achaemenid attackers, and were soon crushed by attackers that come from the back, crushing the city of Byzantium in the process. The soldiers surrendered, and the battle was over. First of all, the Byzantium army was basically completely, supposedly, wiped out, wiped out during the siege of Byzantium in 510 BC, if they even had an army in the first place. But the city still fell, nonetheless, and no maps, no maps of the battle are shown, mostly because Herodotus, I don't think, was actually there, or maybe he was. But Herodotus did write about this in several locations, and the man I mentioned in the beginning, on tennis, is the man we're going to speak about right now. He was the son of Sisamenes, and he was a judge in the Achaemenid Empire, and he was later a satrap of Iona during the reign of Darius the Great in around 500 BC. In Histories 5, 
which is basically like the thing Herodotus wrote. Um, Herodotus speaks of Atanis. There is several Atanis. There's actually like two, by the way. And but this one is a son of Sisamenes. And he served as a judge under and uh Sisamenes was a, a man who served under as a judge under Cambyses the second. Wait, no, that was that was Atanis, never mind. Atanis served as judge under Cambyses and Darius. And um he followed the campaign and became a governor in Asia Minor. He became supreme commander of the United Forces of the people of the Aegean. And he destroyed Byzantium and he um, suppressed the Iowan revolt and participated in the Battle of Ephesus. This thing that is on the screen right now is a map of Constantinople during the Byzantine time. Sadly, there is no pictures of Byzantium during the Greek city-states, which is kind of uh, awkward, to say the least. A man named Asirojus provoked the Ionian revolt with a city, because a city he had named, I think, starts with an M, Melina or something. That city he wanted to keep, but the Persians wanted to take a direct control of it. So, naturally... He provoked a revolt, and the revolt started several battles. The Battle of Sardis, and then the Battle of Phegeus. The Battle of Phegeus, we're going to talk about right now. First things first is actually Miletus, and it's Aristo, Arista, Aristajoras, and he was the tyrant. He was uh, basically like a dictator, but not considered a dictator. There were several more battles in the Ionian Revolt, and it lasted until 493 BC, when the Persians finally destroyed the Ionian Revolt, and it started in 499 BC, lasting for a total of six years. We won't, I won't cover the Ionian Revolt that detailed in this video, but let's get to it. Also, excuse me. First, though, we must talk about the Siege of Naxos. A few decades after the Persians conquered Iona and in the reign of Darius the Great, well, I already talked about Aristajoras, but he was, but, but they wanted to siege Naxos. The reason? To extend the boundaries of the Persian Empire. As you can see, Naxos is right here, the first Persian Empire is right there. In where Turkey is, but well, let's get to it. But before we do that, I want to introduce two more major characters. Artaphernes, right? Is that how you say it? Artaphernes, yes, and Megabates. Arta Artaphernes was satrap of Lydia, and Megabates was appointed the general and leader. Of the siege of Naxos. Aristodorus quickly joins up with Megabates and they set off for the Greek island of Naxos. Aristodorus and Megabates quickly argue with each other, leading to the failed invasion and siege of Naxos. Artaphernes and Megabates quickly got to the island of Naxos. By the way, this one blue ship represents 200 ships. Because, like, I don't have 200 ships. The men finally got off the island to see a reinforced garrison on Naxos. The men quickly surrounded it and sieged it. They laid siege to it for four months. During that time, which the Naxians quickly attacked back and killed some of their men, since they had dozens of cavalry. And... They did not, specifically the Persians. Herodotus, in his history, in the Book of Histories, says that Megabates sent messengers to Naxos during the journey to Naxos, telling of the Persians' intention. 
It is also possible that the story was made up by Arisa Joros because he didn't like Megabades. But they finally retreated after four months due to no money. The casualties for a four-month siege are high. The Persians had very a lot of casualties, but they had 40,000 men, while the Naxians had 27,000 men, but they lost less. Arisodorus and Megabates kept on arguing the whole way back. But now, we must talk about Hyastius. This man was the uncle of Aristodorus and killed at the Battle of Sardis by Artaphernes. Remember, we talked about Aristodorus, but we shall expand on it. He abdicated from the empire. No, he abdicated from his role and, and basically seceded from the empire and declared Miletius to be a democracy. This was composed by him to make the Milesians, Milesians, join the revolution and join Arisa Joras. Sardis was Artaphernes' capital, and Artaphernes took Hyustius Hi hostage. This obviously was to make Arisa Joras try to attack the Persians. But the battle wouldn't be as successful as Arisodoros would think. Arisodoros allied himself with the Athenians and some of the men from Naxos and quickly came from the coast and left Megabades. The men finally got to the city where the Battle of Sardis would begin. This force was guided by Ephesians. Arisodoros quickly began losing the battle as the citadel was burned on accident as Herodotus states, but the Greeks were eventually destroyed and completely routed due to loss of morale. Aristodorus left with them, and then General Antanes went to to go and attack Aristodorus. A cavalry reinforcement came to re reinforce Antanes and to help Artaphernes. But seeing that there was no, no men, no Greeks there, Antonis was like, "We're gonna go attack them at Ephesus," and quickly set off for the battle that was about to ensue. The men under Aristodorus kept on retreating, unaware that General Antonis would come with a bunch of cavalry to quickly destroy them. They quickly kept on retreating to Ephesus, where they thought. They would stay and not be destroyed. But General Antanas came with his cavalry completely crushing and destroying the demoralized Greeks who became completely routed and well, the Persians suffered very little casualties. The Greeks suffered and, and almost the whole army was destroyed in the process. The Greeks retreated almost their entire army being destroyed. So far, the revolts for Arisodorus had been a failure. He had lost the battles of Sardis and Ephesus, and both times his army was routed, and the Athenians basically didn't ally themselves with the Ionians anymore, giving Arisodorus the disadvantage, and so the revolt should have been quelled, but it wasn't. The revolt spread further to the kingdoms of Cyprus and other cities. Helles Point and Propontis actually joined the revolt after Arisodorus, specific, specifically the Ionians, sent men to those two cities, basically garrisoning it. Garrisoning it. At the Battle of Sardis, a Greek general named Eulcides was killed, and many consider him a hero. He was an athlete and an Athenian. And he was killed by the Persians in the Battle of Sardis uh, at 498 BC. Correction, 
he worked for the Athenians, but he was actually an Eritrean. These failed battles quickly led to more revolutions, though, throughout Cyprus as well, where Persia had not established enough control over the region. Cy Cy Cyprus kingdoms began revolting against them, and now we shall see how the Ionians struck back. Now we should get behind the revolt at Cyprus. On it, the revolt was led by Onesilus, who is the king of Somalis, which shows it on this map. And all this was part of the Achaemenid, or we shall say, First Persian Empire. But he quickly led the revolt, and he was the younger brother of King Gorgas of Salamis, who was both kings. Actually, no. Gorgas wasn't king at that time. And, actually, no, wait, they were, they were joint kings. So, Gorgas refused to take the risk, and Onesilus quickly pushed him out, expelled him from the city, forced him into exile, and, well, took control of Somalis. He triggered a revolt against the Persians. And, on Cyprus, only Amethyst remained, remained, well, loyal to them. So, Onesilus wanted to besiege the city and called for help from the Ionians. Onesilus quickly led his men to Amathus to start a siege which would last for about a year. He had the help of every other city-state in Cyprus except for Amathus. So his army, most likely, was massive. They soon would reach Amathus and besiege it. The siege would last from 498 to 497 BC. The men quickly arrived and quickly began attacking, but the cavalry charges forced some to desert in favor of the Persians, and quickly this completely routed and destroyed what remained of Onesilus's men. They fought bravely, but in the end, were cut down. The fighting we just saw happened at the end of the siege. Yeah. Onesilus had been killed in the fighting, and so the Ionians sadly retreated. In the next video, we shall talk about the siege of Paphos and the battles at sea. We shall also talk about in the next video about the Battle of Salamis, Hellas Point, Propontis, and the siege of, or battle of Carais. So far, the Ionian Revolt is not going that good, but it is shaking up the first Persian Empire, also known as the Achaemenid Empire. Make sure to like, subscribe, and press the bell for notifications for our next video, for my next video, not our, I'm, I'm by myself. My next video on the Ionian Revolt. See you in the next amazing historical video.